354. What a friend we have in Jesus. Not, and everyone, 
will yeah. come. Thank but I, I couldn't believe the difference. You're welcome. That's phenomenal. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and so, they're from York. They're from York? York. We'll let them in. <laughs> Some people that live in that direction, we make an exception. <laughs> I want to press in a little bit on this before we go on. I don't want to beat you over the head with it, but you can see who we are. We need to invite people to come into this sanctuary. We need to share Jesus with people. It's our calling. In fact, that's one of the things that we were leading into this morning in Sunday school, and we'll talk about again next Sunday a little bit more in depth about Noah and his calling, what an impossible task it was, his calling. His first task was to do what God had called him to do, to be a righteous man, to do uh, all of God's command. So what I want to encourage you to do, we have two weeks, two Sundays, this Sunday, well actually one, uh, uh, next week and then it will be Easter. In the next two full weeks, I'd like you to grab some of these little booklets that we talked about before, just like you did at Christmas, and thanks again to Rick for his hard work. These are really nice cards. They really are. I think this is just the neatest thing. Um, put the card, I think Rick actually put the cards in the booklet on Saturday. They're all set up for you. All you have to do is go have a conversation with your friends, your family, and your neighbors. That's all you have to do. And then you have to pray your brains out. Just as Pastor was sharing his prayer request for people who come in the store. We need to bring people into this sanctuary so they can hear about Jesus. We really do. So I'm going to press in. I'm not going to beat you over the head, twist your arm. Too bad. But I do want you to be prayerful about if you don't know someone right now, you could invite to come on Easter Sunday, then you don't know enough people. And uh, maybe you don't know any non-Christians to come. Maybe uh, we're gonna pray. We're gonna pray for people in the next two Tuesday night prayer times. We're gonna pray for you all to bring people with you to Easter Sunday morning because we want them to hear the gospel. Whether you're married to them or whether you just know them across the street, bring them with you. We're going to have a coffee hour, and there was some confusion that Dale pointed out. Dale. Um, uh, I had initially said 10 o'clock, but uh, because, and this is on me, because Babs and I were out playing on uh, Wednesday and Thursday. i got to blame it on my wife. Um, and I didn't get back to Rick in time. I originally thought 10 o'clock to start the coffee hour, and Rick put in 9.30. That's fine with me unless somebody has a serious objection. Um, actually, give us an extra few minutes to visit with people you bring. And that's the whole point of having a coffee hour, not just to show them how good a cook you are. So, and there is a sign up for that in the back for bringing that sweet rolls. But anyway, I'm pretty excited about it. I'm, I'm trying, I'm scared to death. You can pray for me about the, uh, the children's a lesson up front if we get kids, so Crystal and boys need to get here on that Sunday morning, along with others, the kids we haven't even met yet. So uh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to try it. It's out of my comfort zone, way out of my comfort zone, but I'll give you a try, and you can pray for them. But anyway, we're in Acts chapter 9. You think maybe we're going to be talking about Paul, but we're not. We're going to be talking about Because Paul gets all the press. You ever notice that? Everywhere you go, Paul gets the press. He gets the PR. He's the big guy. And rightfully so. But if it weren't for his friend, maybe he wouldn't be anywhere at all. And so the friend I'd like to talk about this morning is Barnabas. Because everybody needs a friend. And thank you, Joan. I don't know how you knew that song. How did you know to that song? I don't get it. How, how did you know? What a friend. Behind every great pastor is at least a bunch of really fantastic women. <laughs> so between Babs and Leslie, and this is not polygamy, this is just giving praise for the people that keep things afloat here, you know. Uh, 
So thank you. I just appreciate that very much. Anyway, talking about friendship, I don't know if you have one, but I, I, I have one really, really good friend. And I don't have many really, really good friends. And by friends, I mean somebody you can always count on at any time for almost anything, to do anything, to go anywhere, uh, not only for the serious times in life, but those times when you just crazy, silly, and you do things because you're friends. Uh, I have one of those kinds of friends. We call him Murph. Now Murph is a little younger than me, so I'm probably a bad influence on him. <laughs> but Murph, Murph is the kind of guy, he lives over in Maloney Way, and he's just a great guy, and, and um, we've known each other for, gosh, I don't know, maybe 35 years, about. And uh, when we first met, we hung out a lot together. We were young guys, and uh, well, younger guys, and not long married, and, and we were out one day gallivanting around in my pickup truck, my old Ford F100 pickup truck, which they don't make anymore. They only make those titanium ones. Even if you like Fords, you can't get a 100. But anyway, we're out bebopping around, and uh, we, we got hungry, so we pulled into McDonald's in Geneseo. And while we pulled into McDonald's, we happened to notice while we were parked facing where um, um, Mr. Seconds and the Chinese restaurant and the, that, that used to be Big End Plaza down there. And so we were looking at that, and the, uh, 20A goes across there and we're sitting there munching our hamburgers and we see the, the neighbor, my neighbor's pickup truck go by filled with big sacks of feed driven by the farmer's wife. I said, Murph, Susan just drove by with a pickup full of feed in big sacks. The whole back of the truck bed was right up to the top with feed sacks and she pulled in the big end at the time. She parked her truck and left it there and we watched her walk into big end. I said, Murph, you want to have some? Leslie, cut it out. I said, Murph, you want to have some fun? Yeah, let's go have some fun. Let's go steal all the feed out of the back of her truck. <laughs> <laughs> this is what friendship is about. So we went we, we quick ditched our hamburgers, you know, walked them down, and we drove across the road, backed up to Susan's pickup truck, and she had been to like King Cole Bean Company and gotten feed for she was sheep feed, because he had a lot of sheep at the time, had a big flock. And so I said, just heave them in, just heave them in. I don't know, it must have been 20, 25, 100 pound sacks of feed in that truck. I'm telling you what, I got all of it in my back. I said, We're, this, is, this is too much work, it's too much fun. And he said, no, nah, keep going, keep going. We unloaded the whole pickup truck, put it in my pickup truck, and we drove back to McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> so we sat there until Susan came out of Big End. We'll talk about, we laughed so hard we had to go in and use McDonald's restaurant. <laughs> She came out, and she, at first she didn't notice, and walked around in the driver's side door. All of a sudden, it struck her that something's not right. And she looked, she looked in the bed of the truck with this look of shock and astonishment. Where did her pickup truck load go? And she, was, she walked around the truck once, then another time. She looked under the truck. She starts looking around, all around, and we're over there just dying of laughter. This is my friend Murph. This is how we get ourselves into trouble. And we have gotten ourselves into more trouble over the years than two guys are allowed to get into trouble. So anyway, pretty soon Susan could see that there was no sign, no trace of her pickup truck full of seed. And she, she had to go home and tell her husband she, her, her, her truckload of grain was stolen. So, Murph and I got out of our pickup truck and we walked to the driveway of McDonald's and I crossed the road to the driveway of Big Ed and waited for Susan to pull up. And as she pulled up to the stop sign, her going like this. <laughs> she was a little perturbed. She was really not happy. 
But that's the kind, and then we transferred it all back into her truck, and it was a lot of work, but it was one of the funniest things that we ever did. I don't know what possesses. You know, friends generate uh, creative ways to express their relationship. That was just one of many. Uh, but Murph is also the guy who, when I had a brain hemorrhage, came to my house and tried to fix the plumbing in my upstairs bathroom. It was more trouble than it was worth, but he tried to come, he helped mow the grass, he helped do odds and ends that I couldn't physically do anymore for almost a year, and he was always there. When his wife had uh, uh, mastectomies, we were there, and so it's always reciprocating, it's always reciprocating. He uh, is a good friend and will continue to be so. But friendship is an important thing. So what I'd like to do is look at Barnabas because we often think of him as the son of encouragement, which is of course what Barnabas means. His other name is uh, Joseph, which may mean, means may God add. The guy's a pretty cool dude by all accounts. And he sort of comes out of nowhere a little bit. But we know a lot about this guy, Barnabas. In fact, we may know as much about Barnabas as we do any of the other apostles. And by the way, he is named an apostle in Acts chapter 14. That's not in your outline, but you can check it. Acts chapter 14, verse 14. He and Paul are called apostles who are off on their missionary journeys. But what happens with that's wonderful about Barnabas. In Acts 4, chapter 4, we'll go backwards a bit. He, we know that he sold the field and he gave it all. That was just before uh, the two, the married couple comes and gives a portion as though they gave it all. God strikes him dead. Barnabas knew what the score was and gave everything from the sale of the field. In fact, one of the things that's pretty neat about Barnabas, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, he supported himself in ministry. That passage tells us he was never a burden on the people he was sent to minister to. He supported himself. We know he was a Levite, and he was from the island of Cyprus, but uh, what's neat about him, in Acts chapter 15, we know that he's called a leader and a preacher. In Acts chapter 11, uh, 23 and 24, we, he was sent to Antioch to preach. And in Acts chapter 13, he went with Paul on Paul's first missionary journey. And he even had a significant impact on um, racial relationships when uh, he said in Acts 15, Gentiles and Jews should be able to fellowship together on equal footing. He stuck his neck out. And of course, the part we sometimes make more of than we need to, but it's worth noting that in Acts chapter 15, he disagrees with Paul. In fact, he disagrees so sharply, the two of them, that they agree to part company. But Barnabas is a pretty exciting guy. He is the kind of guy that sticks up. As we look at this passage here in Acts 9, we see this little snippet about him, beginning in verse 26. It says, when he came, to, I'm reading from the NIV today, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. So we, we could be talking about Paul and say, well, Paul is, poor Paul, he has this remarkable conversion experience and nobody trusts him. Well, I'm sorry, but if I lived there, I wouldn't trust him either until he had a track record. Excuse me. But somewhere along the line, Barnabas, sees something about him and says it's the real deal. Hey, listen, you guys, it's the real deal. Paul is the real deal. You can trust him. How do I know? Verse 27, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Barnabas is going to stick his neck out for somebody he believes is had a genuine conversion experience and now is fully committed without reservation to the the risen Lord Jesus Christ. He has this absolute surety about it, so much so that he puts his own reputation on the line. That's a huge deal. Now I suppose that the only parallel that I can come up with right now offhand is to say, 
when you have a relationship like this, if one person says it, you just back them up. If Paul says it, Barnabas is going to back them up, unless it's an error in doctrine. It's sort of like a, um, when, when I was on campus, I worked with a young man who was born on the day Babs and I were married. He was a precious man to me, uh, both the Babs and I married him and his wife. I won't tell you the rest of the story, but they were precious people. But we always said, if Pastor Dave said it, it was the same as if Mike said it. If Mike said it, it was the same as if Pastor Dave said it. There was no ever division between, we had disagreements, but there was no division. We always came down to that thing about what was our calling on campus, and that was to see people come to know Christ, and that those who were in Christ grew in grace, always. That's the thrust, that's the two purposes, uh, basically one. But um, that's what Barnabas does. If Paul says it, then I back him up. Barnabas took him and brought him. Now that's a pretty big deal. I think it goes both ways. I think the apostles were afraid, certainly, of Paul, but I think Paul might have been just as reluctant to meet the apostles. So how are you going to get them together? You need a friend. You need a friend. Now, these days, our lives are so busy, trying to develop good friendships is really difficult. Especially among men. It, because, number one, it's difficult, I think, for men, really, frankly, to develop deep relationships. It happens, but it's not always easy. I think women... Uh, I'm sorry if this sounds chauvinistic again, but I think women have uh, more flexibility in their uh, capacity to develop a close relationship with a woman. But even that is difficult in this culture. Look what he goes on to say in verse 27. Barnabas told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. I think that's a pretty good comment on either he's just, he, it's an entrapment or there's a genuine conversion. If it's a genuine conversion, he's preaching fearlessly, let's see if it bears fruit. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. It's a really interesting situation here. They began to embrace him because of the friendship of Barnabas. Barnabas is going to encourage Paul to do what he's been called to do. This is big. Do you have any friends in your life who encourages you to do what you have been called to do in Christ? <clears throat> I hope you do. Whether you're a man or you're a woman, young or old, matters a little. That age, but what matters is whether or not you have someone in your life, like the saying in scripture, iron sharpens uh, uh, excuse me, iron sharpens iron, and uh, what happens here is that you should have a friend who helps sharpen you in your calling. Sometimes it's our wives who say, it's time to get up in the morning, I'll do your tie, I'll pick out your clothes, and off we go. I'm not talking about you, John. I'm talking about Babs. <laughs> because Babs picks out my outfit. Because if I did, I could probably try out for the circus. You know? But, uh, but everybody needs somebody who's going to encourage them. And if you can't, first you have to say, Lord, what is it that I'm called to do? In Barnabas' case, it was to present Saul, Paul, to the apostles and give him some authenticity, some references, so that Paul could be embraced by the apostles and they could move beyond that point to do what they had all been called to do, which is to share the gospel message about Jesus Christ. So ladies, it's great and wonderful and blessed that you are studying the book of Acts, but you should hold each other to uh, the encouragement to one another and say, well, what have we been called? Well, to learn the scriptures. What's the purpose of learning scriptures? Just for yourself? Or that you might share it with others? Just a thought. 
If all you're doing is learning, any of us are just learning scriptures to hold it here, then we kind of miss the mark of what God calls us to, seems to me. But what I'd really like to talk about here this morning is that we have a friend that models all the qualities of friendship that we could possibly want, and that's what happens here in John chapter 15. And I'm going to go through this quickly because it is such a wonderful thing. In John chapter 15, we read these words. Jesus says, I call you friends for everything that I learned from my Father I have made known to you. The Greek word there is phagos. And it means this, and it's written on your outline, someone dearly loved, prized in a personal, intimate way. I hope you have someone in your life like that. I hope you have someone in your life like that. The second definition, someone held dear in a close bond of personal affection. I hope you have someone in your life like that. It might be your wife or your husband, your brother, your sister. It might be your closest friend. Someone that you confide in. Sometimes I think we are people who have so many secrets, hidden things about our life that we carry around, that we just don't know who to trust. We don't know who to talk to about it. But Jesus says, I have confided everything in you. That's what friendship's about. Someone who loves us, prizes us, loves us, cares for us. Someone held dear to us. Someone who we would be willing almost to lay down our lives for. Because we trust them to such an extent. Those friendships are rare. Now I hope and I pray we have those kind of relationships, but I don't think they're that common. I really don't. As we continue in the next part of the outline, we look at Jesus and we say from John 15, well, is Jesus my friend? He is, but he's not the same kind of friend that we have between human beings. Why is that? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that it's not a mutual or reciprocal friendship relationship. It is a relationship. But there are things that set Jesus Christ apart from us and in our humanness that we cannot reciprocate. Number one, He is our Lord. We can't reciprocate lordship to Him. We can offer him submission to his lordship in that relationship. You see, that's the kind of growing relationship he wants. He is our savior and messiah. We can never be that to him. But we can accept the truth of his sacrifice and his life so that we might live eternally with him because his, as we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It's a wonderful kind of thing because we can't do that for him. It's a one-way kind of friendship on that. He's the king of kings. Can we talk to him on level ground if he's the king of kings? Of course not. But again, we can submit to the authority of the king in our life. He is very God, and we are not. <laughs> what he's done for us by dying on the cross of becoming an incarnate God is something we can never do for Him. So there's a level of friendship between us and Christ which we can't uh, manage. We can, he is a friend to us, but it's difficult for us to be a friend to Him because we can't reciprocate. In John 15, 13, one of the things that he does for us, he says, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And remember from Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, ladies, I think you're there someplace. While we were still his enemies, what did Christ do? He died for us. Who does that? Christ does that. In John chapter 15, verse 14, he says, You are my friends if you do what I command. It's one of those strangely reversed conditional quote sentences, which is really saying, If you do what, you, what I command, you are my friends. 
That is to say, there is a little bit of a string to it. You need to be obedient and do what I call you to if you want to be my friends. This is a, this whole business of Barnabas, who was a remarkable guy. We can have a relationship with Barnab Barnabas, which is mutual and reciprocal. It goes both ways. We're both able to give equal amounts. But that's not the way it is with Christ. But he gives us a model of what does a true friend do for his friend? He lays down his life if necessary for his friends. Even if there is a disagreement between the two friends, even if there is a sharp disagreement between two friends, a true friend will always be willing to do whatever they need to do in order to demonstrate a love for that person. That's pretty huge. For those of us who are married, we know all about that. We know that there is a certain level of uh, sacrifice necessary in a married relationship that says we're not the same identical people, that we're going to make sacrifices for one another. Babs is making sacrifices for me every single day. I don't know how she does it. <laughs> She's got to be getting tired of it. But I think she thinks she has me about broken in by now after 48 years. So I think she's holding out to see if the next couple will straighten things out a little bit. But she's always doing that. She's always sacrificing for me. Um, and I hope it works to some extent the other way. And it's important that's the way friendship should look. So when we look at Barnabas, we're saying, Barnabas, you stood up for him. Uh, for Paul. That's huge. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody who is your friend walks away in difficult times? Most of us have been in that situation. But if you've ever been in a situation that's really tough, maybe it's a medical thing, maybe it's a domestic thing, maybe it's a work-related thing, maybe it's a health thing, and your friend comes to your aid to hold you up in prayer. Now Murph's wife is one of our dear friends as well, of course, and because Murph is such a great guy, he has a magnificent wife. And her wife and my wife are the most significant prayer warriors I've ever run into. They pray for everything and anything, sometimes just at the spur of the moment, just a phone call or a text away. When there's trouble, and there's been ample amount of it um, over these many years, they pray for the one for the other, for their spouses, and for our children, particularly. That's what friends do. It's a pretty powerful place to be. My encouragement this morning is that you find, if you haven't already, find a Barnabas in your life. Find somebody who's going to model Christ. Someone who will encourage you to do all that you're called to do in Christ. There is strength in that kind of relationship. One of the things I did, and this is a jump, and I, I'm so amazed that you put it, because at the end of our sheet are the words from the first verse of what a friend we have in Jesus. I think it's a precious song. We do have a friend in Jesus. We can talk to him. He, he bears all our sins and griefs. Look at that. And that we are privileged even to be able to have access to his throne because of his sacrifice for us. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Have you ever noticed how much less agony you feel when you're going through a really challenging, difficult, horrible time if you have a really good friend that you can go to and hold hands with and pray, confide in, knowing that even when you separate physically, the prayers will go on. That's good friendship. Let's make sure we cultivate those in this church so that others can see this is a church that really loves one another. And I think it does. I think it is. I really do. I see some pretty cool things. So I'm excited as we move toward Easter, as we begin talking more in a focused way about Jesus, about who he is. Barnabas is kind of that model. That's how we're supposed to live. But Jesus is the ultimate temple of how we are to love one another, how we are to be friends with one another. 
And again, that passage from Romans 8, I'm convinced because Jesus is my friend, neither death nor life, nor demons nor angels, neither present nor future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a promise. That's the kind of friend we have in Christ our friend. Father, bless us and your word. We thank you for Barnabas sticking up for Paul and for the remarkable man he was. We thank you, Father, that he serves as an example to us of how we need to defend and stick up for one another, how we need to cultivate good, deep friendships to strengthen our walk and our calling so that we might live out what it is you've called us to. Father, thank you so much. Bless us this week as we go out. Lay on our hearts people we can invite to the Easter service Sunday. And I pray, Father, that those people will be receptive to the invitation and come. I pray from Isaiah 43, verse 7, that they will come from the north, the south, the east, and the west, through these doors, into these pews, into the sanctuary, and they will come because they won't even know why they're coming. Maybe they think they're coming because someone nagged them to come. Maybe somebody invited them to come. But Father, we know that if they come, that you put eternity in their hearts and they want to know the truth about Jesus Christ, even if they don't know it when they sit down. But they will when they hear the message of Jesus Christ, who loves them and gave his life up for them. Father, it is our calling. Help us to love our friends, our family, and our neighbors with an unbridled love that says, I must introduce these people to Jesus Christ. Father, help us to live that out in the next two weeks in a more specific, intentional, fervent way that others too might come not only into this church, but into the, the, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, so that this church, as Ed uh, acknowledged uh, earlier this morning, we are the kind of church that gives uh, over and abundantly of what is asked for when it comes to services and finances. Let us also be a church that is known for giving over and above the calling to which we're called and invite people to hear about Jesus Christ. I pray we might do this for your glory. Help us to hold nothing back. Help us to be real friends to people we know who don't know Jesus by telling them about Christ. We thank you. We pray your blessing on our time today and as the week unfolds, be with us that we might be your ministers in Christ's name. Amen. Take your hymnal and turn to hymn number 451, 451. Wonderful, wonderful.
able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or possibly imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.